This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Corrie Samuel. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Book One, Chapter Five, Part Sixteen. The history of Monmouth would alone suffice to refute the imputation of inconstancy which is so frequently thrown on the common people. The common people are sometimes inconstant, for they are human beings. But that they are inconstant as compared with the educated classes, with aristocracies, or with princes, may be confidently denied. It would be easy to name demagogues whose popularity has remained undiminished. While sovereigns and parliaments have withdrawn their confidence from a long succession of statesmen, when Swift had survived his faculties many years, the Irish populace still continued to light bonfires on his birthday, in commemoration of the services which they fancied that he had rendered to his country when his mind was in full vigour. While seven administrations were raised to power and hurled from it in consequence of court intrigues. Or of changes in the sentiments of the higher classes of society, the profligate Wilkes retained his hold on the selections of a rabble whom he pillaged and ridiculed. Politicians who, in eighteen o seven, had sought to curry favour with George the Third by defending Caroline of Brunswick, were not ashamed, in eighteen twenty, to curry favour with George the Fourth by persecuting her. But in eighteen twenty, as in eighteen o seven. The whole body of working men was fanatically devoted to her cause. So it was with Monmouth. In 1680, he had been adored alike by the gentry and by the peasantry of the West. In 1685, he came again. To the gentry, he had become an object of aversion, but by the peasantry, he was still loved with a love as strong as death, with a love not to be extinguished by misfortunes or faults, by the flight from Sedgemoor, by the letter from Ringwood. Or by the tears and abject supplications at Whitehall, the charge which may with justice be brought against the common people is not that they are inconstant, but that they almost invariably choose their favourites so ill that their constancy is a vice and not a virtue. While the execution of Monmouth occupied the thoughts of the Londoners, the counties which had risen against the government were enduring all that a ferocious soldiery could inflict. Feversham had been summoned to the court, where honours and rewards which he little deserved awaited him. He was made a knight of the garter, and captain of the first and most lucrative troop of life guards. But court and city laughed at his military exploits, and the wit of Buckingham gave forth its last feeble flash at the expense of the general who had won a battle in bed. Feversham left in command at Bridgewater Colonel Percy Kirk, a military adventurer. Whose vices had been developed by the worst of all schools, Tangier. Kirk had, during some years, commanded the garrison of that town, and had been constantly employed in hostilities against tribes of foreign barbarians, ignorant of the laws which regulate the warfare of civilized and Christian nations. Within the ramparts of his fortress, he was a despotic prince. The only check on his tyranny was the fear of being called to account by a distant and careless government. He might therefore safely proceed to the most audacious excesses of rapacity, licentiousness, and cruelty. He lived with boundless dissoluteness and procured by extortion the means of indulgence. No goods could be sold till Kirk had had the refusal of them. No question of right could be decided till Kirk had been bribed. Once, merely from a malignant whim, he staved all the wine in a vintner's cellar. On another occasion, he drove all the Jews from Tangier. Two of them he sent to the Spanish Inquisition, which forthwith burned them. Under this iron domination, scarce a complaint was heard, for hatred was effectually kept down by terror. Two persons who had been refractory were found murdered, and it was universally believed that they had been slain by Kirk's order. When his soldiers displeased him, he flogged them with merciless severity, but he indemnified them by permitting them to sleep on watch, to reel drunk about the streets. To rob, beat, and insult the merchants and the labourers. When Tangier was abandoned, Kirk returned to England. He still continued to command his old soldiers, who were designated sometimes as the First Tangier Regiment 
and sometimes as Queen Catherine's regiment. As they had been levied for the purpose of waging war on an infidel nation, they bore on their flag a Christian emblem, the Paschal Lamb. In allusion to this device, and with a bitterly ironical meaning, these men, the rudest and most ferocious in the English army, were called Kirk's Lambs. The regiment, now the second of the line, still retains this ancient badge, which is, however, thrown into the shade by decorations honourably earned in Egypt, in Spain, and in the heart of Asia. Such was the captain, and such the soldiers, who were now let loose on the people of Somersetshire. From Bridgewater Kirk marched to Taunton. He was accompanied by two carts, filled with wounded rebels whose gashes had not been dressed, and by a long drove of prisoners on foot, who were chained two and two. Several of these he hanged as soon as he reached Taunton, without the form of a trial. They were not suffered even to take leave of their nearest relations. The signpost of the White Hart Inn served for a gallows. It is said that the work of death went on in sight of the windows where the officers of the Tangier Regiment were carousing, and that at every health a wretch was turned off. When the legs of the dying man quivered in the last agony, the colonel ordered the drums to strike up. He would give the rebels, he said, music to their dancing. The tradition runs that one of the captives was not even allowed the indulgence of a speedy death. Twice he was suspended from the signpost, and twice cut down. Twice he was asked if he repented of his treason, and twice he replied that, if the thing were to do again, he would do it. Then he was tied up for the last time. So many dead bodies were quartered, that the executioner stood ankle-deep in blood. He was assisted by a poor man, whose loyalty was suspected, and who was compelled to ransom his own life by seething the remains of his friends in pitch. The peasant who had consented to perform this hideous office afterwards returned to his plough, but a mark like that of Cain was upon him. He was known through his village by the horrible name of Tom Boylman. The rustics long continued to relate that, though he had, by his sinful and shameful deed, saved himself from the vengeance of the lambs, he had not escaped the vengeance of a higher power. In a great storm he fled for shelter under an oak, and was there struck dead by lightning. The number of those who were thus butchered cannot now be ascertained. Nine were entered in the parish registers of Taunton, but those registers contain the names of such only as had Christian burial those who were hanged in chains, and those whose heads and limbs were sent to the neighbouring villages, must have been much more numerous. It was believed in London, at the time, that Kirk put a hundred captives to death during the week which followed the battle. Cruelty, however, was not this man's only passion. He loved money, and was no novice in the arts of extortion. A safe conduct might be bought of him for thirty or forty pounds, and such a safe conduct, though of no value in law, enabled the purchaser to pass the post of the lambs without molestation, to reach a seaport, and to fly to a foreign country. The ships which were bound for New England were crowded at this juncture, with so many fugitives from Sedgemoor that there was great danger lest the water and provisions should fail. Kirk was also, in his own coarse and ferocious way, a man of pleasure, and nothing is more probable than that he employed his power for the purpose of gratifying his licentious appetites. It was reported that he conquered the virtue of a beautiful woman by promising to spare the life of one to whom she was strongly attached, and that, after she had yielded, he showed her suspended on the gallows the lifeless remains of him, for whose sake she had sacrificed her honour. This tale an impartial judge must reject. It is unsupported by proof. The earliest authority for it is a poem written by Pomfret. The respectable historians of that age, while they speak with just severity of the crimes of Kirk, either omit all mention of this most atrocious crime, or mention it as a thing rumoured but not proved. Those who tell the story tell it with such variations as deprive it of all title to credit. Some lay the scene at Taunton, some at Exeter, some make the heroine of the tale a maiden, some a married woman. The relation for whom the shameful ransom was paid is described by some as her father, by some as her brother, and by some as her husband. Lastly, the story is one which, long before Kirk was born, had been told of many other oppressors, and had become a favourite theme of novelists and dramatists. Two politicians of the fifteenth century, 
Rinsalt, the favourite of Charles the Bold of Burgundy, and Oliver Le Dane, the favourite of Louis the Eleventh of France, had been accused of the same crime. Cintio had taken it for the subject of a romance. Whetstone had made out of Cintio's narrative the rude play of Promos and Cassandra, and Shakespeare had borrowed from Whetstone the plot of the noble treasure comedy of Measure for Measure. As Kirk was not the first, so he was not the last, to whom this excess of wickedness was popularly imputed. During the reaction which followed the Jacobin tyranny in France, a very similar charge was brought against Joseph Le Bon, one of the most odious agents of the Committee of Public Safety, and after inquiry was admitted even by his prosecutors to be unfounded. The government was dissatisfied with Kirk, not on account of the barbarity with which he had treated his needy prisoners. But on account of the interested lenity which he had shown to rich delinquents, he was soon recalled from the west. A less irregular and more cruel massacre was about to be perpetrated. The vengeance was deferred during some weeks. It was thought desirable that the western circuit should not begin till the other circuits had terminated. In the meantime, the jails of Somersetshire and Dorsetshire were filled with thousands of captives. The chief friend and protector of these unhappy men in their extremity was one who abhorred their religious and political opinions, one whose order they hated, and to whom they had done unprovoked wrong, Bishop Ken. That good prelate used all his influence to soften the jailers, and retrenched from his own episcopal state that he might be able to make some addition to the coarse and scanty fare of those who had defaced his beloved cathedral. His conduct on this occasion was of a piece with his whole life. His intellect was indeed darkened by many superstitions and prejudices, but his moral character, when impartially reviewed, sustains a comparison with any in ecclesiastical history, and seems to approach, as near as human infirmity permits, to the ideal perfection of Christian virtue. His labour of love was of no long duration; a rapid and effectual jail delivery was at hand. Early in September, Jeffreys. Accompanied by four other judges, set out on that circuit of which the memory will last as long as our race and language. The officers who commanded the troops in the districts through which his course lay had orders to furnish him with whatever military aid he might require. His ferocious temper needed no spur; yet a spur was applied. The health and spirits of the Lord Keeper had given way. He had been deeply mortified by the coldness of the King and by the insolence of the Chief Justice. And could find little consolation in looking back on a life, not indeed blackened by any atrocious crime, but sullied by cowardice, selfishness, and civility. So deeply was the unhappy man humbled that, when he appeared for the last time in Westminster Hall, he took with him a nosegay to hide his face, because, as he afterwards owned, he could not bear the eyes of the bar and of the audience. The prospect of his approaching end seems to have inspired him with unwonted courage. He determined to discharge his conscience, requested an audience of the king, spoke earnestly of the dangers inseparable from violent and arbitrary counsels, and condemned the lawless cruelties which the soldiers had committed in Somersetshire. He soon after retired from London to die. He breathed his last a few days after the judges set out for the west. It was immediately notified to Jeffreys that he might expect the great seal as the reward of faithful and vigorous service. End of part sixteen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Corey Samuel. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Book One, Chapter Five, Part Seventeen. At Winchester, the Chief Justice first opened his commission. Hampshire had not been the theatre of war, but many of the vanquished rebels had, like their leader, fled thither. Two of them, John Hicks, a nonconformist divine, and Richard Nelthorpe, a lawyer who had been outlawed for taking part in the Rye House plot, had sought refuge at the house of Alice, widow of John Lyle. John Lyle had sat in the Long Parliament and in the High Court of Justice, had been a Commissioner of the Great Seal in the days of the Commonwealth, and had been created a Lord by Cromwell. 
the titles given by the protector had not been recognised by any government which had ruled England since the downfall of his house, but they appeared to have been often used in conversation even by royalists. John Lyle's widow was therefore commonly known as the Lady Alice. She was related to many respectable, and to some noble families, and she was generally esteemed, even by the Tory gentlemen of her country. For it was well known to them that she had deeply regretted some violent acts in which her husband had borne a part, that she had shed bitter tears for Charles I, and that she had protected and relieved many cavaliers in their distress. The same womanly kindness which had led her to befriend the royalists in their time of trouble would not suffer her to refuse a meal and a hiding-place to the wretched men who now entreated her to protect them. She took them into her house, set meat and drink before them, and showed them where they might take rest. The next morning her dwelling was surrounded by soldiers. Strict search was made. Hicks was found concealed in the malt-house, and Nelthorpe in the chimney. If Lady Alice knew her guests to have been concerned in the insurrection, she was undoubtedly guilty of what in strictness was a capital crime. For the law of principle and accessory, as respects high treason, then was, and is to this day, in a state disgraceful to English jurisprudence. In cases of felony, a distinction founded on justice and reason is made between the principal and the accessory after the fact. He who conceals from justice one whom he knows to be a murderer is liable to punishment, but not to the punishment of murder. He, on the other hand, who shelters one whom he knows to be a traitor is, according to all our jurists, guilty of high treason. It is unnecessary to point out the absurdity and cruelty of a law which includes under the same definition, and visits with the same penalty, offences lying at the opposite extremes of the scale of guilt. The feeling which makes the most loyal subject shrink from the thought of giving up to a shameful death the rebel who, vanquished, hunted down, and in mortal agony, begs for a morsel of bread and a cup of water, may be a weakness, but it is surely a weakness very nearly allied to virtue, a weakness which, constituted as human beings are, we can hardly eradicate from the mind without eradicating many noble and benevolent sentiments. A wise and good ruler may not think it right to sanction this weakness, but he will generally connive at it, or punish it very tenderly. In no case will he treat it as a crime of the blackest dye. Whether Flora MacDonald was justified in concealing the attainted heir of the Stuarts, whether a brave soldier of our own time was justified in assisting the escape of Lavalette, are questions on which casuists may differ, but to class such actions with the crimes of Guy Fawkes and Fieschi is an outrage to humanity and common sense. Such, however, is the classification of our law. It is evident that nothing but a lenient administration could make such a state of the law endurable, and it is just to say that, during many generations, no English government, save one, has treated with rigour persons guilty merely of harbouring defeated and flying insurgents. To women especially has been granted, by a kind of tacit prescription, the right of indulging, in the midst of havoc and vengeance, that compassion which is the most endearing of all their charms. Since the beginning of the great civil war, numerous rebels, some of them far more important than Hicks or Nelthorpe, have been protected from the severity of victorious governments by female adroitness and generosity. But no English ruler who has thus been baffled, the savage and implacable James alone excepted, has had the barbarity even to think of putting a lady to a cruel and shameful death for so venal and amiable a transgression. Odious as the law was, it was strained for the purpose of destroying Alice Lyle. She could not, according to the doctrine laid down by the highest authority, be convicted till after the conviction of the rebels whom she had harboured. She was, however, set to the bar before either Hicks or Nelthorpe had been tried. It was no easy matter in such a case to obtain a verdict for the Crown. The witnesses prevaricated. The jury, consisting of the principal gentlemen of Hampshire, shrank from the thought of sending a fellow-creature to the stake for conduct which seemed deserving rather of praise than of blame. Jeffreys was beside himself with fury. This was the first case of treason on the circuit, and there seemed to be a strong probability that his prey would escape him. He stormed, cursed, and swore in a language which no well-bred man would have used at a race or a cockfight. One witness, named Dunn, partly from concern for Lady Alice, and partly from fright at the threats and maledictions of the Chief Justice, 
entirely lost his head, and at last stood silent. "'Oh, how hard the truth is,' said Jeffreys, "'to come out of a lying Presbyterian knave.' The witness, after a pause of some minutes, stammered a few unmeaning words. "'Was there ever!' exclaimed the judge with an oath. "'Was there ever such a villain on the face of the earth? "'Dost thou believe there is a God? "'Dost thou believe in hell-fire? "'Of all the witnesses that I ever met with, "'I never saw thy fellow.' Still the poor man, scared out of his senses, remained mute, and again Jeffreys burst forth. "'I hope, gentlemen of the jury, that you take notice of the horrible carriage of this fellow. How can one help abhorring both these men and their religion? A Turk is a saint to such a fellow as this. A pagan would be ashamed of such villainy. Oh, blessed Jesus! What a generation of vipers do we live among!' "'I cannot tell what to say, my lord,' faltered Dunn the judge again broke forth into a volley of oaths. "'Was there ever,' he cried, "'such an impudent rascal! Hold the candle to him that we may see his brazen face. You, gentlemen, that are of counsel for the crown, see that an information for perjury be preferred against this fellow.' After the witness had been thus handled, the Lady Alice was called on for her defence. She began by saying what may possibly have been true that though she knew Hicks to be in trouble when she took him in, she did not know or suspect that he had been concerned in the rebellion. He was a divine, a man of peace. It had, therefore, never occurred to her that he could have borne arms against the government, and she had supposed that he wished to conceal himself because warrants were out against him for field-preaching. The Chief Justice began to storm. "'But I will tell you, there is not one of these lying, snivelling, canting Presbyterians, but one way or another, had a hand in the rebellion. Presbytery has all manner of villainy in it. Nothing but Presbytery could have made done such a rogue. Show me a Presbyterian, and I'll show thee a lying knave." He summed up in the same style, declaiming during an hour against Whigs and dissenters, and reminded the jury that the prisoner's husband had borne a part in the death of Charles I, a fact which had not been proved by any testimony, and which, if it had been proved, would have been utterly irrelevant to the issue. The jury retired, and remained long in consultation. The judge grew impatient. He could not conceive, he said, how in so plain a case they should even have left the box. He sent a messenger to tell them that, if they did not instantly return, he would adjourn the court and lock them up all night. Thus put to the torture they came, but came to say that they doubted whether the charge had been made out. Jeffreys apostulated with them vehemently, and after another consultation they gave a reluctant verdict of guilty. On the following morning sentence was pronounced. Jeffreys gave directions that Alice Lyle should be burned alive that very afternoon. This excess of barbarity moved the pity and indignation even of the class which was most devoted to the Crown. The clergy of Winchester Cathedral remonstrated with the Chief Justice, who, brutal as he was, was not mad enough to risk a quarrel on such a subject with a body so much respected by the Tory party. He consented to put off the execution five days. During that time the friends of the prisoners besought James to be merciful. Ladies of high rank interceded for her. Feversham, whose recent victory had increased his influence at court, and who, it is said, had been bribed to take the compassionate side, spoke in her favour. Clarendon, the king's brother-in-law, pleaded her cause. But all was vain. The utmost that could be obtained was that her sentence should be commuted from burning to beheading. She was put to death on a scaffold, in the market-place of Winchester, and underwent her fate with serene courage. In Hampshire Alice Lyle was the only victim. But on the day following her execution Jeffreys reached Dorchester, the principal town of the county in which Monmouth had landed, and the judicial massacre began. The court was hung, by order of the Chief Justice, with scarlet, and this innovation seemed to the multitude to indicate a bloody purpose. It was also rumoured that, when the clergyman who preached the assize sermon enforced the duty of mercy, the ferocious mouth of the judge was distorted by an ominous grin. These things made men augur ill of what was to follow. More than three hundred prisoners were to be tried. The work seemed heavy, but Jeffreys had a contrivance for making it light. He let it be understood that the only chance of obtaining pardon or respite was to plead guilty. Twenty-nine persons, who put themselves on their country and were convicted, 
were ordered to be tied up without delay. The remaining prisoners pleaded guilty by scores. Two hundred and ninety-two received sentence of death. The whole number hanged in Dorsetshire amounted to seventy-four. From Dorchester, Jeffreys proceeded to Exeter. The civil war had barely grazed the frontier of Devonshire. Here, therefore, comparatively few persons were capitally punished. Somersetshire, the chief seat of the rebellion, had been reserved for the last and most fearful vengeance. In this county two hundred and thirty-three prisoners were, in a few days, hanged, drawn, and quartered. At every spot where two roads met, on every market-place, on the green of every large village which had furnished Monmouth with soldiers, ironed corpses clattering in the wind, or heads and quarters stuck on poles, poisoned the air and made the traveller sick with horror. In many parishes the peasantry could not assemble in the house of God without seeing the ghastly face of a neighbour grinning at them over the porch. The chief justice was all himself. His spirits rose higher and higher as the work went on. He laughed, shouted, joked, and swore in such a way that many thought him drunk from morning to night. But in him it was not easy to distinguish the madness produced by evil passions from the madness produced by brandy. A prisoner affirmed that the witnesses who appeared against him were not entitled to credit. One of them, he said, was a papist, and another a prostitute. "'Thou impudent rebel!' exclaimed the judge, "'to reflect on the king's evidence. I see thee, villain, I see thee already with the halter round thy neck.' Another produced testimony that he was a good Protestant. "'Protestant,' said Jeffreys, "'you mean Presbyterian. I'll hold you a wager of it. I can smell a Presbyterian forty miles.' One wretched man moved the pity even of bitter Tories. "'My lord,' they said, "'this poor creature is on the parish.' "'Do not trouble yourselves,' said the judge. "'I will ease the parish of the burden.' It was not only against the prisoners that his fury broke forth. Gentlemen and noblemen of high consideration and stainless loyalty, who ventured to bring to his notice any extenuating circumstance, were almost sure to receive what he called, in the coarse dialect which he had learned in the pothouses of Whitechapel, a lick with the rough side of his tongue. Lord Stowell, a Tory peer, who could not conceal his horror at the remorseless manner in which his poor neighbours were butchered, was punished by having a corpse suspended in chains at his park gate. In such spectacles originated many tales of terror, which were long told over the cider by the Christmas fires of the farmers of Somersetshire. Within the last forty years peasants in some districts well knew the accursed spots, and passed them unwillingly after sunset. End of part 17This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot O-R-G. Recorded by Christy Nowak. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Book One, Chapter Five, Part Eighteen. Jeffreys boasted that he had hanged more traitors than all his predecessors together since the conquest. It is certain that the number of persons whom he put to death in one month and in one shire very much exceeded the number of all the political offenders who have been put to death in our island since the Revolution. The rebellions of 1715 and 1745 were of longer duration, of wider extent, and of more formidable aspect than that which was put down at Sedgemoor. It has not been generally thought that, either after the rebellion of 1715 or after the rebellion of 1745, the House of Hanover erred on the side of clemency. Yet, all the executions of 1715 and 1745 added together will appear to have been few indeed when compared with those which disgraced the bloody assizes. The number of the rebels whom Jeffreys hanged on this circuit was three hundred and twenty. Such havoc must have excited disgust, even if the sufferers had been generally odious. But they were, for the most part, men of blameless life and of high religious profession. They were regarded by themselves and by a large portion of their neighbors, not as wrongdoers, but as martyrs, who sealed with blood the truth of the Protestant religion. Very few of the convicts professed any repentance for what they had done. Many, 
animated by the old Puritan spirit, met death not merely with fortitude, but with exultation. It was in vain that the ministers of the established church lectured them on the guilt of rebellion and on the importance of priestly absolution. The claim of the king to unbounded authority in things temporal, and the claim of the clergy to the spiritual power of binding and loosing, moved the bitter scorn of the intrepid sectaries. Some of them composed hymns in the dungeon, and chanted them on the fatal sledge. Christ, they sang while they were undressing for the butchery, would soon come to rescue Zion and to make war on Babylon, would set up his standard, would blow his trumpet, and would requite his foes tenfold for all the evil which had been inflicted on his servants. The dying words of these men were noted down, their farewell letters were kept as treasures, and, in this way, with the help of some invention and exaggeration, was formed a copious supplement to the Marian martyrology. A few cases deserve special mention. Abraham Holmes, a retired officer of the parliamentary army, and one of those zealots who would own no king but King Jesus, had been taken at Sedgemoor. His arm had been frightfully mangled and shattered in the battle, and, as no surgeon was at hand, the stout old soldier amputated it himself. He was carried up to London and examined by the king in council, but would make no submission. I am an aged man, he said, and what remains to me of life is not worth a falsehood or a baseness. I have always been a Republican, and I am so still. He was sent back to the West and hanged. The people remarked with awe and wonder that the beasts which were to drag him to the gallows became restive and went back. Holmes himself doubted not that the angel of the Lord, as in the old time, stood in the way, sword in hand, invisible to human eyes, but visible to the inferior animals. "'Stop, gentlemen,' he cried. "'Let me go on foot. There is more in this than you think. Remember how the ass saw him whom the prophet could not see.' He walked manfully to the gallows, harangued the people with a smile, prayed fervently that God would hasten the downfall of Antichrist and the deliverance of England, and went up the ladder with an apology for mounting so awkwardly. You see, he said, I have but one arm. Not less courageously died Christopher Baltuscombe, a young Templar of good family and fortune, who, at Dorchester, an agreeable provincial town proud of its taste and refinement, was regarded by all as the model of a fine gentleman. Great interest was made to save him. It was believed, through the west of England, that he was engaged to a young lady of gentle blood, the sister of the sheriff, that she threw herself at the feet of Jeffreys to beg for mercy, and that Jeffreys drove her from him with a jest so hideous that to repeat it would be an offense against decency and humanity. Her lover suffered at Lyme piously and courageously. A still deeper interest was excited by the fate of two gallant brothers, William and Benjamin Hewling. They were young, handsome, accomplished, and well-connected. Their maternal grandfather was named Kiffin. He was one of the first merchants in London, and was generally considered as the head of the Baptists. The Chief Justice behaved to William Hewling on the trial with characteristic brutality. "'You have a grandfather,' he said, "'who deserves to be hanged as richly as you.' The poor lad, who was only nineteen, suffered death with so much meekness and fortitude that an officer of the army who attended the execution, and who had made himself remarkable by rudeness and severity, was strangely melted, and said, I do not believe that my Lord Chief Justice himself could be proof against this. Hopes were entertained that Benjamin would be pardoned. One victim of tender years was surely enough for one house to furnish. Even Jeffreys was, or pretended to be, inclined to lenity. The truth was that one of his kinsmen, from whom he had large expectations, and whom therefore he could not treat as he generally treated intercessors, pleaded strongly for the afflicted family. Time was allowed for a reference to London. The sister of the prisoner went to Whitehall with a petition. Many courtiers wished her success. And Churchill, among whose numerous faults cruelty had no place, obtained admittance for her. I wish well to your suit with all my heart, he said as they stood together in the antechamber. But do not flatter yourself with hopes. 
This marble, and he laid his hand on the chimney piece, is not harder than the king. The prediction proved true. James was inexorable. Benjamin Hewling died with dauntless courage, amidst lamentations in which the soldiers who kept guard round the gallows could not refrain from joining. Yet those rebels who were doomed to death were less to be pitied than some of the survivors. Several prisoners, to whom Jeffreys was unable to bring home the charge of high treason, were convicted of misdemeanors, and were sentenced to scourging not less terrible than that which Oates had undergone. A woman, for some idle words, such as had been uttered by half the women in the districts where the war had raged, was condemned to be whipped through all the market towns in the county of Dorset. She suffered part of her punishment before Jeffreys returned to London, but when he was no longer in the West, the jailers, with humane connivance of the magistrates, took on themselves the responsibility of sparing her any further torture. A still more frightful sentence was passed on a lad named Tuchin, who was tried for seditious words. He was, as usual, interrupted in his defense by ribaldry and scurrility from the judgment seat. You are a rebel, and all your family have been rebels since Adam. They tell me that you are a poet. I'll cap verses with you. The sentence was that the boy should be imprisoned seven years, and should, during that period, be flogged through every market town in Dorsetshire every year. The women in the galleries burst into tears. The clerk of the arraigns stood up in great disorder. My lord, he said, the prisoner is very young. There are many market towns in our county. The sentence amounts to a whipping once a fortnight for seven years. If he is a young man, said Jeffreys, he is an old rogue. Ladies, you do not know the villain as well as I do. The punishment is not half bad enough for him. All the interest in England shall not alter it. Tuchin, in his despair, petitioned, and probably with sincerity, that he might be hanged. Fortunately for him, he was, just at this conjuncture, taken ill of the smallpox and given over. As it seemed highly improbable that the sentence would ever be executed, the Chief Justice consented to remit it, in return for a bribe which reduced the prisoner to poverty. The temper of Tuchin, not originally very mild, was exasperated to madness by what he had undergone. He lived to be known as one of the most acrimonious and pertinacious enemies of the House of Stuart and of the Tory party. The number of prisoners whom Jeffreys transported was eight hundred and forty-one. These men, more wretched than their associates who suffered death, were distributed into gangs and bestowed on persons who enjoyed favor at court. The conditions of the gift were that the convicts should be carried beyond sea as slaves, that they should not be emancipated for ten years, and that the place of their banishment should be some West Indian island. This last article was studiously framed for the purpose of aggravating the misery of the exiles. In New England or New Jersey, they would have found a population kindly disposed to them and a climate not unfavorable to their health and vigor. It was therefore determined that they should be sent to colonies where a Puritan could hope to inspire little sympathy, and where a laborer born in the temperate zone could hope to enjoy little health. Such was the state of the slave market that these bondmen, long as was the passage, and sickly as they were likely to prove, were still very valuable. It was estimated by Jeffreys that, on average, each of them, after all charges were paid, would be worth from ten to fifteen pounds. There was therefore much angry competition for grants. Some Tories in the West conceived that they had, by their exertions and sufferings during the insurrection, earned a right to share in the profits which had been eagerly snatched up by the sycophants of Whitehall. The courtiers, however, were victorious. The misery of the exiles fully equaled that of the Negroes who are now carried from Congo to Brazil. It appears from the past information which is at present accessible that more than one-fifth of those who were shipped were flung to the sharks before the end of the voyage. The human cargoes were stowed close in the holds of small vessels. So little space was allowed that the wretches, many of whom were still tormented by unhealed wounds, could not all lie down at once without lying on one another. They were never suffered to go on deck. The hatchway was constantly watched by sentinels, armed with hangers and blunderbusses. In the dungeon below, all was darkness, stench, lamentation, disease, and death. Of ninety-nine convicts who were carried out in one vessel, 
Twenty-two died before they reached Jamaica, although the voyage was performed at usual speed. The survivors, when they arrived at their house of bondage, were mere skeletons. During some weeks, coarse biscuit and fetid water had been doled out to them in such scanty measure that any one of them could easily have consumed the ration which was assigned to five. They were, therefore, in such a state that the merchant to whom they had been consigned found it expedient to fatten them before selling them. Meanwhile, the property both of the rebels who had suffered death and of those more unfortunate men who were withering under the tropical sun was fought for and torn in pieces by a crowd of greedy informers. By law, a subject attainted of treason forfeits his substance, and this law was enforced after the bloody assizes with a rigor at once cruel and ludicrous. The broken-hearted widows, the destitute orphans of the laboring men whose corpses hung at the crossroads, were called upon by the agents of the treasury to explain what had become of a basket, of a goose, of a flitch of bacon, of a keg of cider, of a sack of beans, of a truss of hay. While the humbler retainers of the government were pillaging the families of the slaughtered peasants, the chief justice was fast accumulating a fortune out of the plunder of a higher class of Whigs. He traded largely in pardons. His most lucrative transaction of this kind was with a gentleman named Edmund Prudhoe. It is certain that Prudhoe had not been in arms against the government, and it is probable that his only crime was the wealth which he had inherited from his father, an eminent lawyer who had been high in office under the protector. No exertions were spared to make out a case for the crown. Mercy was offered to some prisoners on condition that they would bear evidence against Prudhoe. The unfortunate man lay long in jail, and at length, overcome by fear of the gallows, consented to pay fifteen thousand pounds for his liberation. This great sum was received by Jeffreys. He bought with it an estate to which the people gave the name of Acaldema, from that accursed field which was purchased with the price of innocent blood. He was ably assisted in the work of extortion by the crew of parasites who were in the habit of drinking and laughing with him. The office of these men was to drive hard bargains with convicts under the strong terrors of death, and with parents trembling for the lives of children. A portion of the spoil was abandoned by Jeffreys to his agents. To one of his boon companions, it is said, he tossed a pardon for a rich trader across the table during a revel. It was not safe to have recourse to any intercession except that of his creatures, for he guarded his profitable monopoly of mercy with jealous care. It is even suspected that he sent some persons to the gibbet solely because they applied for the royal clemency through channels independent of him. Some courtiers nevertheless contrived to obtain a small share of this traffic. The ladies of the Queen's household distinguished themselves preeminently by rapacity and hard-heartedness. Part of the disgrace which they incurred falls on their mistress, for it was solely on account of the relation in which they stood to her that they were able to enrich themselves by so odious a trade, and there can be no question that she might with a word or a look have restrained them. But in truth she encouraged them by her evil example, if not by her express approbation. She seems to have been one of that large class of persons who bear adversity better than prosperity. While her husband was a subject, and in exile, shut out from public employment, and in imminent danger of being deprived of his birthright, the suavity and humility of her manners conciliated the kindness even of those who most adhorred her religion. But when her good fortune came, her good nature disappeared. The meek and affable duchess turned out an ungracious and haughty queen. The misfortunes which she subsequently endured have made her an object of some interest, but that interest would not be a little heightened if it could be shown that, in the season of her greatness, she saved, or even tried to save, one single victim from the most frightful proscription that England has ever seen. Unhappily, the only request that she is known to have preferred, touching the rebels, was that a hundred of those who were sentenced to transportation might be given to her. The profit which she cleared on the cargo, after making large allowance for those who died of hunger and fever during the passage, cannot be estimated at less than a thousand guineas. We cannot wonder that her attendants should have imitated her unprincely greediness and her unwomanly cruelty. 
They exacted a thousand pounds from Roger Hoare, a merchant of Bridgewater, who had contributed to the military chest of the rebel army. But the prey on which they pounced most eagerly was one which it might have been thought that even the most ungentle natures would have spared. Already some of the girls who had presented the standard to Monmouth at Taunton had cruelly expiated their offense. One of them had been thrown into prison, where an infectious malady was raging. She had sickened and died there. Another presented herself at the bar before Jeffreys to beg for mercy. "'Take her, jailer!' vociferated the judge, with one of those frowns which had often struck terror into stouter hearts than hers. She burst into tears, drew her hood over her face, followed the jailer out of the court, fell ill of fright, and in a few hours was a corpse. Most of the young ladies, however, who had walked in the procession were still alive. Some of them were under ten years of age. All had acted under the orders of their schoolmistress, without knowing that they were committing a crime. The Queen's maids of honor asked the royal permission to wring money out of the parents of the poor children, and the permission was granted. An order was sent down to Taunton that all these little girls should be seized and imprisoned. Sir Francis War of Hestercombe, the Tory member for Bridgewater, was requested to undertake the office of exacting the ransom. He was charged to declare in strong language that the maids of honor would not endure delay that they were determined to prosecute to outlawry unless a reasonable sum were forthcoming, and that by a reasonable sum was meant seven thousand pounds. War excused himself from taking any part in a transaction so scandalous. The maids of honor then requested William Penn to act for them, and Penn accepted the commission. Yet it would seem that a little of the pertinacious scrupulosity which he had often shown about taking off his hat would not have been altogether out of place on this occasion. He probably silenced the remonstrances of his conscience by repeating to himself that none of the money which he extorted would go into his own pocket, that if he refused to be the agents of the ladies they would find agents less humane, that by complying he should increase his influence at the court, and that his influence at the court had already enabled him, and still might enable him, to render great services to his oppressed brethren. The maids of honor were at last forced to content themselves with less than a third part of what they had demanded. End of part 18